thank you very much, from a multiplicity of objects to just one um, Exxon Binto. And although it's uh, an archival artifact rather than a museological one, I think uh, there are lots of points in common uh, and that will be resonant uh, with the sort of things um, that uh, have been discussed in the earlier sessions. Um, Doomsdale is, of course, foundational to the way lots of people see the normal conquest in the 11th century. It has a very wide resonance among the public, at least as wide as the Roman conquest as such. One of the very few texts uh, that um, has genuine public recognition. That's Magna Carta, the only two, really, and Doomsday Book always comes out much higher than uh, Magna Carta. It's a text produced by repeated copying, let's remind ourselves. Here's a much later medieval manuscript illumination of the sort of copying that produces Doomsday Book, um, with the scribe taking from one booklet, uh, balanced precariously on the top lectern, uh, into the one that he's working on directly. Crucial to making good, accurate use of what Doomsday Book says for all sorts of purposes, from academic uh, through to um, all sorts of heritage uses uh, and uh, educational and knowledge by the public, is a fuller understanding of how the information that is in Doomsday Book got in there. Let's remind ourselves that uh, Doomsday Book is a family of texts. This is the great Doomsday Book, the one with, with which people are familiar. Um, <coughs> strikingly different in format uh, and in page layout and in script, both from Little Doomsday Book, covering the three eastern counties, and from uh, the Exxon Doomsday of the project, which um, I've, I'm still working on. Um, is uh, a couple of pages of Exxon Doomsday Book, uh, a much smaller page format, um, looks physically very different and with lots more interlineations and corrections by the scribes who wrote it. Exxon Doomsday precedes both Great Doomsday and Little Doomsday. It's the earliest direct witness of the whole process of the Doomsday Survey. The making of Doomsday Book um, the Doomsday Survey through to Great Doomsday Book was undoubtedly a complex process, has, has always been recognised. And some of the recognitions um, amount to an admission of bafflement by uh, the complexity of the processes. Here's uh, the late John Dodgson, um, a names specialist, uh, saying that when trying to understand the personal names and the place names in Doomsday, so we have to allow for place name and personal name spellings in Doomsday Book, which represent the mishearing, mispronunciation, misreading, and miscopying of names at each stage of a process of transmission along the interface between different languages and different scripts through the medium of good, bad, and indifferent readers, writers, speakers, hearers, and copyists. We have to allow for the acoustics of deafness and poor dentition. Uh, Dodge, in other words, had despair of summarising or understanding the process of Doomsday Book, which I suggest that are, are central to understanding the content of Doomsday Book. Uh, uh, on your handout, uh, on, on, the, on the back, uh, you see that I made a brief note of the three successive models, on to number two, uh, of the making of Doomsday Book. Uh, uh, Horace Round in 1895, Vivian Galbraith in 1961, and the current model, um, followed by most historians, including amateur local historians, David Roths of 2000. Uh, though it has to be said that it isn't always easy to understand what David Roth means uh, about a very complex process. In all these schemes, Exxon Doomsday has been neglected. Uh, it's called Exxon Doomsday because the manuscript is in Exeter Cathedral, it's been in chapter manuscript 3500. One of the reasons for its neglect is that it is distant from the Golden Triangle of Oxbridge and London, I think. Um, I checked by one of my colleagues on the visitor's book in the reading room in Exeter Cathedral, reveals that some people who've written quite convincingly about Exxon Doomsday haven't actually looked at it. <laughs> um, uh, though there has been a scratchy microfilm in circulation since the 1960s. That necessary because the only edition uh, until now, the only edition is of 1816, 
with, of course, no proper modern critical apparatus, not even a usable index to look up individual places. Uh, and the way it's been treated in other publishing projects um, uh, concerned with Doomsday Book, that's to say the VCH in the Edwardian period, the Fillimore Doomsday in the 1980s, and the Electo Doomsday in the 1990s, has not been satisfactory. So, um, between 2014 and 2017, there has been a, a well-funded interdisciplinary multi-person project, the Exxon project. Uh, and I put some summary details on the front of the handout there about the, the name of the project and the members of the large team who've been working on it. We'd expected simply to produce an accurate new online edition with state-of-the-art functionality, uh, which is about to go live in, in a very few days' time. In the end, we found that we've done more than that, and we have produced what is in effect a completely new account of the making and purposes of Doomsday as a whole, reached from first principles and drawing from a much fuller understanding of Exxon. In particular, a close paleographical description of it um, uh, by the colleague who sat in the reading room in Exxon Cathedral for 18 months and described the handwriting line by line, word by word, in a report that runs to um, 3,000 pages of double space A4. Um, also drawn from a from, from first principles uh, uh, survey of the literature on the making of Doomsday Book itself. Now, Doomsday Studies are a very well-tilled field, and parts of what we see now as the processes have been seen by others but never in this particular combination, which we think for the first time takes account of the earliest manuscript witness of the whole process, Exxon Doomsday, uh, and puts together all the other elements uh, that are needed. There are two larger points uh, in what we are, uh, are proposing. The first is that the Doomsday Survey was built on existing documentation. Um, public documents, the, the Geld accounts, the accounts of the land tax that was um, being collected concurrently with Great Doomsday Book. Uh, and private documents, uh, we believe that there must have been extensive seigneurial records of estate administration, of which fragments of a dozen or two do survive here and there from late Anglo-Saxon and early Norman England. Um, no one could have contemplated doing something like Doomsday Book unless they expected every manorial reeve to be able to turn up and say, We've got 26 goats uh, and 48 cows uh, and 53 pigs and so many acres of woodland and so on. The second larger point is our fundamental disagreement with the existing model of David Roth um, in uh, several respects. The three most important are that something very like Great Doomsday Book was the intended uh, output of the survey all along. David Roth has it uh, that it's an afterthought and that one should, one should think separately of what he calls the inquest, and we don't think it's an inquest, but of course a survey and the book. Secondly, that Great Doomsday Book as we have it was not the only output, the only intended output of the survey, but only the only one that survives in full as it was originally written. Bits and pieces of other outputs, however, do survive, so it's clear that produced along the way were summaries of the overall value of individual landowners' landed estates, which went to the Treasury, so that the Treasury was fully informed about the value of lands that might well be liable to fall into the King's hands through the forfeiture of a rebel baron or simply the death of an abbot or bishop. Uh, William II immediately starts making use of that information in uh, the retention in his own hands of vacant abbeys and bishoprics. Uh, and thirdly, that information, secondly rather, that information about tax matters is fed back into the process of collecting the tax, which is going on concurrently with the making of the Doomsday Survey. And thirdly, that Doomsday Book produces lists of disputes between um, Baron A and Baron B, or between a baron and one of the churches, um, or between the king's officers uh, and a baron, disputes about the ownership of land, to be resolved at another time and place. 
or not resolved, because it was often to the king's advantage um, to, to hold. Uh, if two barons were disputing a piece of land, um, the king's agents could very probably take money from both of them uh, on the promise that the, um, the, the, the dispute would be resolved in some way in the future. Uh, and the third way in which we um, disagree with Roth is, that, is indeed that we see that the process of doomsday as seamless. Uh, the writing of Great Doomsday starting uh, in August 1086 and continuing to around the time of William I's death 13 months later. So, so I put a summary of uh, our account of the making of Doomsday book again under item 3 on, on the back of the handout. I won't go through that in detail. We have uh, modelled it in various ways and one of the most powerful uh, to be convinced that it could have been done in the time of Ellul. Uh, one of the most striking new facts at our disposal is the knowledge that the Exxon phase of the process, this manuscript, was written by as many as 29 different scribes. So this is a large team effort uh, being put into uh, the quick writing of an intermediate stage between the information as originally gathered uh, in uh, stages uh, one, two, and three, um, and then stage four of the process, um, which led immediately to stage five. The other striking thing about these, one or two of these scribes um, are late interventions in the manuscript. Uh, you'll see right at the end that the scribe of Great Dunes, the book itself, writes a handful of entries in the Exxon manuscript. One entry, we know from the information it tells itself, the entry for the Bishop of Winchester's Manor of Taunton, um, needed some additional information added to it because the king confirmed the Bishop of Winchester in possession of two outlying estates during the doomsday process. Um, and the text itself says um, that the king ordered the Bishop of Durham to have this fact recorded in the writings. And that whole section is rewritten by a scribe who must have done it in response to that information. Um, let me concentrate briefly on, on the fourth stage. Now I'll say a little bit more about the Exxon stage uh, of it. Here is um, another page of Exxon written by the scribe we called Eta. Uh, they all have Greek letters except when we run out of the Greek alphabet um, and some of them have other names like Z. Um, all of the scribes, uh, without exception, are Frenchmen, and we know this because of the form of the writing, and indeed because of some particular characteristics uh, of the language that they use. Um, there is variability even in the ordinary Latin vocabulary between scribes, despite a clear attempt to impose uniformity of terminology. Uh, and, in, and in spellings of uh, personal names and place names, so that one knows particularly that Scribe Beta was a Frenchman when on one occasion he writes the name of Earl Harold as Araldus without an H, and it, only a Frenchman could have written it like that, I think, uh, uh, without the H. Eta, this scribe, is in fact a scribe who's particularly well attuned to the old English language. He's the one scribe, much more than any of the others, who preserves the Old English spelling forms from the earlier written stage of uh, the Doomsday process in names like Charlton, which he always has as Chiorla Tuna, with the C-E-O-R-L-A-T-U-N. In other words, he's preserved all the vowel sounds as they would have been in Old English. Uh, there are other indications that he was a Frenchman, uh, including one here on this individual page, where Beta has written entirely writing at the bottom of the page, and in the middle of the section, he goes on onto the, onto the facing page, a fragment of a biblical text um, uh, from the story of the miracle at Cana, um, where water is being turned into wine, and he's put just the first four words of, the, of, the, of a text. It's not a verb in that, it's not a sentence, just the reminder of a biblical verse. And the first word in the Vulgate is homo, but he's written it homo, again, without the H. He's a Frenchman too. Um, I've taken this reference to wine and water being turned into it as um, 
a thirsty scribe at the end of a hot day, um, thinking it was time he had a break. Um, we've also done a lot of work on uh, the final stage, on the creation of Great Doomsday Book. Uh, and it's quite clear that the scribe of Great Doomsday copies directly from Exxon, but compressing the materials by as much as 40% without leaving out factual information other than the goats and the sheep and the cattle and the pigs. That's the only sort of factual information apart from the by names of pre-conquest landowners and of 1086 subtenants that's left out. Nonetheless, it's reworded and rearranged. Every individual entry is rearranged. So the item, the order of items, which in Exxon Doomsday, of the three sorts of non-arable land, um, in Exxon Doomsday, uh, woodland comes first, and in Great Doomsday, woodland comes last. He takes care systematically, had a, had a way he wanted these things set out. That didn't save any words. It's just some, some, a sense of his of, of the priority of meadowland, which he moves up to first place. Um, uh, let me cut short discussion of of the processes of uh, making Doomsday to say a couple of the implications of this for users of Doomsday Book. Uh, the first is that um, Great Doomsday is very close in time to the gathering of the information. But secondly, one can see from the direct comparison for the southwestern counties between Exxon and Great Doomsday Book that individual pieces of information were accidentally dropped. When he's rearranging these land use resources, he occasionally loses one, and that must be the case in other parts of the country too. Um, the statistics are occasionally confused. All those uh, Roman numbers occasionally got the better even of a very great scribe, as undoubtedly the scribe of Great Doomsday Book was, uh, so that even more so than previously, we are sure that any one statistical piece of information in Doomsday Book might be wrong, but not many of them are, and therefore less reliance than one might have put previously on individual statistics. It's interesting that uh, the very last county to be written up by the scribe of Great Doomsday was Cornwall, and the last few columns of Cornwall have a much higher rate of mistakes uh, than even the first ones of Cornwall. He knew he was coming to an end, and that's probably because William I had died, and he'd been told to finish Great Doomsday and not copy Little Doomsday, and he was getting to the end. Uh, a little bit before I show my final slide about the outreach activities that we've done from the project. The Friends of Exeter Cathedral have been key to everything we do. They're a large body with a uh, uh, large financial and human resources. Uh, the two key figures there were absolutely critical to making use of this volunteer body, the chair and the canon librarian of the cathedral. Through them, we've linked through to volunteers, to the staff of the cathedral, and to the support of the dean, uh, which has been vital too, in um, releasing images, for example. This is the property of the Demon Chapter, and they have been concerned to preserve their intellectual rights over that. All this done, uh, it should be said, at a time of enormous turmoil in uh, the uh, chapter of Exeter Cathedral. The Dean we started with is not the Dean who's there now, uh, but because this is being recorded, I will not uh, go into that in any detail. <laughs> It's all, you know, it's all in the news if you dig around in the Southwest Press. So, so the Friends of Exeter Cathedral, having known nothing really about Exxon Doomsday, are now enormously enthusiastic about it, about making good use of it. Already there are mugs and coasters showing this boring bit of text um, on sale in the cathedral shop. Um, very handsome they are too. We've had a series of events in the cathedral, uh, study days, uh, lectures, which have engaged with several hundreds of people, not all from the Friends. They've been good at putting the word out among other bodies in Exeter. Uh, the education staff uh, at the Cathedral are immensely excited about the prospect of the website going live 
and starting to design ways in which they can use 11th century handwriting for school groups, for example. Write your name in scribe beta's handwriting and show us how it's different from scribe eta's handwriting. Um, we, were all, we were taken aback by how excited they were about the possibility of using uh, the website, which is designed for academic purposes. Uh, through the Friends of the Cathedral, um, we made contacts through the Association of Friends of Cathedrals um, and have given talks in elsewhere in the Southwest and beyond, indeed, in non-Exxon counties at Winchester and Gloucester. So gradually, I think, we are raising knowledge of the existence of Exxon Doomsday. Um, it's been on a few of the of the folios have been on display at Taunton already, and it will be in the big uh, British Library Anglo-Saxon Kingdoms exhibition um, at the end of this year and into 2019, where it will be displayed alongside Great Doomsday Book for the first time since uh, an agent of probably Bishop Osborne of Exeter thought, that's handy, I'll have that, and took it away um, in 1087, I think. Um, which is the only reason it survives. Texts like Exxon must have sort of existed for the rest of the country and been destroyed. The project will feed into discussions which are now going on about how or indeed whether to rebind the folios that were disbound for conservation reasons and then to be photographed, how it will be displayed. Uh, we will write for them uh, a glossy booklet uh, for sale in the cathedral after we've written the big monograph. Uh, there's a knowledge transfer board um, uh, actively at work too. Let me finish with a second artifact uh, which is mysteriously involved in the making of Exxon Doomsday. Uh, when the manuscript was uh, disbound and one of the choirs was opened out and placed face down, this image was seen uh, for the first time, which had not been apparent before. Uh, people had missed it, even though you could see half uh, at a time on each side. The curious thing is that it's not on a random page. Um, this number one here is, is from a, a 17th century or perhaps late 16th century foliation of the manuscript. So at one point, this part of the image is chosen to be the beginning of a a bound version of Exxon. On this side is one of the places where the scribe of Great Doomsday Book has written entries in Great Doomsday's characteristic wording, not in Exxon Doomsday's characteristic wording. It's a rewritten entry, and it's a rewritten entry that has in it the only joke in Doomsday Book, we think. Uh, it's Robert Fitzgerald uh, holding land in Somerset, the second manor, which doesn't have a name here, though we can identify where it was through manorial descents. Uh, in the first version, um, it ended with the valuation of the manor in shillings or pounds. And we know that because for Robert Fitzgerald, we happen to have one of those little fragments of summary that add up all his lands in the southwest. And it has a monetary value that shows that this manor must have been worth 23 pounds. But what the great Doomsday describe has written in here is what it's worth to Robert Fitzgerald in 1086 is 10 sides of bacon and 100 cheeses. And it must be a joke about how Robert Fitzgerald likes bacon burgers. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so with that, uh, I will finish. Thank you.